Housing Council Transportation Committee for February 13th, 2023. Our first order of business tonight is approval of the agenda. Um, I'd entertain a motion to approve the agenda if there are no changes. So moved. moved by Second. Council Member Fredson. Second by Council Member Zarin. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Close nay, and the agenda is approved. Next, we're on to approval of the January 23rd, 2023 Transportation Committee meeting, meeting minutes. If there are no changes or in additions, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Moved by Council Member Cummings. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Sterner. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Cause nay, and the motion carries. We are on to now to reports, and we'll turn first to MTS Director um, Jeff Carlson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Council Members. Uh, we have a number of uh, different items on today's agenda that cover all of our different program areas. So the only thing I'll mention uh, in advance of that uh, is that uh, last, our last meeting I mentioned that we would be, begin a series of uh, listening sessions across the region. Uh, we did have the first listening session last Tuesday in Scott County, so we were uh, happy to join the Scott County Board as well as a number of their key staff and uh, council members uh, representing uh, Scott County District um, uh, for a good discussion. A lot of a lot of great inputs, um, and you know, as well as the um, you know familiarization, refamiliarization, uh, meeting in person, and uh, relationship development that occurred. So. Uh, a good start, uh, but a number of other meetings that have been scheduled or will be scheduled, and we'll invite, uh, as we go through that, the, the council members uh, that represent those districts as we go county by county and uh, beyond. With that, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, I'll just comment quick. The, the listening session it was great, and I think the, um, the county board was very appreciative of, of us coming out rather than having them come somewhere. So I think uh, it's really kind of a good start to things. So, any other questions or comments from council members? All right, then I'm going to turn to interim MTS general manager, Leslie Kinderis, and welcome. All right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. Uh, well, as former General Manager Koistra was re uh, routinely doing during his reports, I'll start by just providing a brief operator hiring update. Um, and actually, at your next meeting, the February 27th meeting, we're going to provide you with our quarterly service change and workforce updates. So you'll get more information then. But I did want to note that our February 4th hiring event uh, was quite successful. We had really strong turnout. Um, this was the event we had at the North Loop Garage that included an opportunity to drive the bus. And uh, we had 156 candidates attend the event. 117 pass interview, and of those, 25 are coming to us with CDLs. So uh, I wanted to share that bit of encouraging news, and again, we'll come back next meeting with more information about the hiring efforts and the uh, upcoming quarterly service changes. Um, second, I wanted to mention that Metro Transit is actively seeking customer and community feedback as part of our Route 17 Better Bus Route project. Uh, in general, Metro Transit's better bus route projects are designed to improve access, speed, and reliability on some of our higher ridership routes. And Route 17 will actually be the fifth route to receive this treatment as part of our broader speed and reliability program. Uh, when a route undergoes this process, Metro Transit evaluates several ways to make improvements, and this can include uh, consolidating bus stop spacing to increase uh, trip efficiency, simplifying the route and schedule, uh, installing concrete pads to improve accessibility for customers, um, and in some cases, installing new shelters at eligible bus stops. Uh, so we have a web page focused on this Route 17 project and we have a customer survey that's currently open and that'll close on March 3rd um, and at this point we anticipate making those improvements uh, this August um, and then I'll also mention just a couple of save the date type uh, items for you uh, first uh, we're starting planning for transit driver appreciation day uh, the official Transit Driver Appreciation Day is March 18th. This year that falls on a Saturday, so we're looking uh, to do the official celebrations the week of March 20th. Uh, so you'll be seeing more information from us with dates and times, but certainly, as always, you're uh, more than welcome to join us and, and use this opportunity to thank operators for all their work. Uh, so please look for more details on that um, coming soon. Uh, the second item I wanted to just have on your radar as well is the American Public Transit 
Transportation Association, or APTA, is holding their mobility conference in Minneapolis this year. Um, the APTA mobility conference focuses on priorities and challenges facing bus and paratransit systems. And they're going to have this year's conference, which is uh, April 23rd through 26th in downtown Minneapolis. So as the host city and the host agency, we're working closely with APTA to make sure that goes smoothly. But certainly wanted you to be aware of that conference coming here. Um, and registration is currently open for that. Um, and finally, this isn't really an update, but just wanted to acknowledge that one of the business items tonight relates to the Metro Gold Line Full Funding Grant Agreement. And you'll talk more about that in a moment, so I don't want to get ahead of that, but I did just want to acknowledge that uh, receiving the FFG, FFGA will be a major milestone for the project and want to recognize and applaud the staff and certainly our project partners um, on their work towards that upcoming milestone. So with that, I'd take any questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Councilmember Member Cummings. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, with the great success of the Drive a Bus project, um, do you anticipate doing that again in the future at some point? I mean, because it wasn't, although the opportunity to drive is rare and very fun, because I got to take advantage of it <laughs> at the rodeo, but um, the publicity around the event Mm -hmm. in all of the media was so positive and so exciting. I think that it was a way to reach out to so many people. I'm just wondering if, and then clearly the results were mm -hmm. um, hopefully as exciting for you as it sounds. And is there any uh, thought of doing mm -hmm. that again? Uh, Chair Barber, Councilmember Cummings. Um, my sense is we've learned a lot from that event and would certainly be open to that. I'm kind of looking at our operations folks to see if, um, yeah, if, yeah, if, CEO Brian Funk would like to come forward and address that more directly. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, Council Member Cummings. So uh, we were actually talking about that the day of the event because we were having so much fun and uh, thought, when can we do this again? Uh, and so we're going to look for that opportunity. Uh, it really came together really nice uh, for this event because we were able to be indoors in the winter. Uh, we had access to you know, our Wi-Fi and offices for interviews, and it was a, a really kind of fantastic setup. Of course, that facility will be in revenue service uh, next month, and so we may not have the same opportunity, but uh, we're trying to brainstorm so we can recreate and hopefully you know, be able to capture some of that uh, moving forward again. Thank you. Right, additional questions or comments from council members? Thank you. Um, we're now on to um, TAC reports, and we have David Finley. Welcome. Thank you very much, Chair Barber and committee members. It's good to be here, I think, for the first time in a few months. Um, we had to, unfortunately, cancel our January meeting because, as we know, it was a beautiful snow, but most of our members uh, use, use uh, Metro Mobility, so we thought it best to cancel the January meeting because um, we know that when we have big snows, all, all transportation gets slowed down, but in particular, metro, uh, metro transit. So that's why I was not here last month. Happy to be here this month. Um, quick, quick updates on what we've been uh, hearing from you all and also um, working on. Uh, first of all, thank you for keeping the wayfinding app IRA in place. It's something that definitely benefits our community. Um, also, um, we got updates on what will be a minivan pilot project to supplement uh, the, metro, um, the metro mobility buses that apparently there's some, there's some um, global supply chain issues. So getting those buses at a reasonable rate is not, is not uh, uh, possible now. So they're moving on to bring in some minivans, I think Chrysler minivans that will be um, uh, uh, modified to fit the needs um, according to, to federal, specula uh, federal speculation, federal regulation, um, federal specs on that. So, so we're gonna hear back from them, I think, I think next month when it comes to uh, the design and hopefully have a site visit um, to make sure that, that everything, you know, not only meets the bare minimum, but, but is, serves folks with disabilities uh, properly. Um, we had a legislative update last month, uh, and, and obviously it's a budget year, so there are some big asks, and we're happy that the legislature's moving at a, at a decent clip. Um, all three of the budget asks will, will definitely benefit, or the three main budget asks will benefit folks with disabilities, so we definitely support that. Um, and also, this is a little weedy, but we did hear about 
uh, uh, the Metropolitan Council um, making the paratransit appeals process open to the public. So when somebody who uses Metro Mobility gets uh, uh, removed for, for, for one reason or another from, from using Metro Mobility, they can appeal that decision. And then there's a three-person panel who then hears that appeal and makes a decision. Um, one of the members on that panel is the TAC chair, so I've done it for the last few years. Um, but that, uh, that panel is now, applications are being opened to the public for that panel. Um, that is all that I have. Uh, happy to take questions if you have them. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions or comments from council members? Council member Cummings. Thank you, I just would like to thank you. I, I, it's so important to get your reports every month and for the work that you and the committee and everyone does and then reporting out to us. I think it's just really, really valuable. So I appreciate it, thank you. My pleasure, my pleasure. I did miss one thing, Chair, if you don't mind, which was probably the most fun thing that we've done since I've been on TAC. And I can't believe I forgot to, to mention it. Uh, speaking of transit worker recognition, we did, um, um, in celebration last year, it was the 30th anniversary of TAC, we did decide to have a disability-led uh, uh, transit uh, worker recognition um, selection process. So we put out to the public to have uh, folks with disabilities, really anybody, we can't say you have to have a disability to nominate this person, but it was implied. Um, uh, people to bring forward transit workers, uh, operators, um, uh, people that take the calls. Uh, to to um, essentially bring forward folks who have gone above and beyond in in their duties um, for the Metropolitan, Metropolitan Council and Metro Transit, and we were supposed to have the the celebration in January, but obviously that was canceled. Uh, so we had it in February, and it went great. We did it right here. Got some cool pictures taken. So hopefully that will go out in a newsletter at one point or another. Uh, but it, I thought it was a lot of fun. We had five folks that we recognized, four of which were there. Um, um, but it was it was it was great. So thank you all for supporting that, and hopefully we'll see some fun some fun comms on that in the in the next in the upcoming months. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I oh, yeah. think that is just a fantastic thing. I mean, I, and I'm going to echo Councilmember Cummings that I think you've really stepped into this role and really expanded what TAC does, and I think it's much much appreciated. So. Wonderful. Thank you all very much. All right. Very good. We can now um, move on to our business. So our first item is the consent agenda. There's one item on consent. Um, I would entertain a motion to approve the item on consent. So moved. Moved by Council Member Fredson. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Sterner. Is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those nay. And the motion carries. <clears throat> Next, we're on to our first non-consent item, which is business item 2023-51, which is safety targets action item. And we have Jed Hansen here. Hello, uh, Madam Chair and Council Members. Um, business item 2023-51 is requesting um, adoption of the 2023 safety performance targets. Um, this presentation today will cover the requirements for target setting and the Council's methodology the proposed targets for 2023 and an assessment of previous performance. The presentation will not cover details of why the numbers are where they are or more disaggregation of numbers. Um, these will be done in an, up, in an upcoming study. Um, these targets are required by the Federal Highway Administration's Safety Performance Final Rule. Their purpose is to inform planning and programming um, to reduce fatal and serious injuries on public roads as well as to track performance of the Federal Highway Safety Improvement Program. State DOTs and MPOs need to establish five targets, um, one for uh, all fatalities and the rate per 100 million vehicle miles traveled, the number of all serious injuries in their rate, and the number of non-motorized uh, fatal and serious injuries combined. MPOs can either establish uh, specific targets for their planning area, or they can agree to support statewide targets set by their state Department of Transportation. MPOs are not assessed or penalized by the Federal Highway Administration for failing to meet targets. However, state DOTs are assessed annually, and it can affect their HSIP allocation if the statewide targets aren't met. Um, the targets must be adopted by February 27th annually. Um, and they're timed about right that we'll bring them to February each year. 
past few years, the council has been setting its own targets. The current method is to reduce targets on a straight line towards the region's share of the Minnesota Strategic Highway Safety Plan goals for 2025. Uh, targets declined from where they were in 2020 and 2021, two years where we held the targets flat. Um, and the statewide goal is no more than 225 deaths and 980 serious injuries um, in that goal year. The regional share of that translates to, by 2025, no more than 74 traffic deaths, 464 serious injuries, and 115 uh, pedestrian and bicycle uh, traffic deaths and serious injuries. The action today is on adopting the proposed target highlighted on this slide here in gray and bolded. Uh, we've provided both uh, the previous two years and the next two years if this methodology were to continue uh, for context you'll still be asked to review these targets annually. So the proposed targets for 2023 are 90 fatalities, a rate of a third per 100 million vehicle miles traveled, 600 serious injuries, a rate of 2.18, and uh, 147 non-motorized fatal and serious injuries. I'll note one thing you may notice on this table here is that the uh, rate target is held flat from the year before. The rate target is based off of um, the all fatalities target, and it's divided by an estimate of future VMT. And in 2022, when we adopted targets, we had used a slightly higher estimate of VMT since the most recent um, observed year was 2020, which was an unusual year for VMT. Um, ultimately, we set these targets so we can assess our region's performance at uh, the ultimate goal of reducing and eliminating traffic deaths and serious injuries. Unfortunately, for the past several years, safety performance has regressed. Um, previously, the region was meeting its targets for two of the five measures, all serious injuries and non-motorized fatal and serious injuries, the whole number, but not the rate targets. Um, preliminary data for 2022 shows that the region not only missed its targets for all measures in 2022, but the crash injuries were at a level where they exceeded the targets um, all prior years since we started setting targets in 2018. Um, this data is preliminary and it only includes the seven county metro. These targets apply to the whole metropolitan planning area, including uh, the urbanized portions of Wright and Sherburne counties. Um, this data may change um, once we get an update from MnDOT and the Department of Public Safety will report on, on the final year end result. This is the same data that is uh, presented in graphical format. Um, since the safety performance rule began, we have not met the fatalities target. However, um, in 2019 and 2020, we started to approach our target level and that pattern changed in 2021. And while there's some variation in crash data from year to year, it's held flat from that prior year, which is starting to apparently sig signal an upward trend. Um, this is similar in serious injuries. We actually had two years where we did meet this target. However, the upward trend has continued. Um, this is also a similar trend in the non-motorized fatal and serious injuries uh, actual performance, um, though notably on this measure, uh, the trend sharpened in the past year as well. While the performance measure that uh, you are considering for adoption today aggregates pedestrian and bicyclists. Um, our partners at MnDOT have provided us this data uh, disaggregated. Um, while pedestrian fatalities declined in 2022, over 2021, they're still higher than the pandemic, uh, the pre-pandemic three-year average. Um, bicyclist fatalities, you'll note, are slightly down. Um, however, they're, they're quite rare, and so the percent change can be quite large by one crash. Um, however, the serious injuries for bicyclists are up significantly, roughly 80% over both of the previous two years and by half over the pre-pandemic average. These targets um, and performance assessment are here to inform how uh, the Met Council, its staff, uh, policymakers, implementing partners can improve safety outcomes. Um, we have a number of work program items uh, that will address safety. Um, in development of the 2050 TPP. Um, as uh, Director Carlson had mentioned, we are uh, underway with a number of stakeholder listening sessions as part of development of the TPP's goals, which is inclusive of the safety direction. 
Um, we also just uh, sent out today a form to the technical staff that participate um, in our 2050 TPP technical working group soliciting feedback on the existing policies and actions in the 2040 TPP to inform the next TPP. The position of safety and related topics has also been under consideration in development of the Regional Development Guide's values and vision as, as uh, the working draft that your group has recently been working on reflects. Additionally, the Regional Safety Action Plan is a consultant study that will soon be underway to include systemic analysis that will provide more insight into crash cause and location and a review of our project selection criteria and weightings. Um, with that, that's the conclusion of my presentation of the item. I am here to answer any questions as well as my colleague, Heidi Schulberg. Again, thank you, Jed. Uh, questions, comments from council members? Council Member Sterner. Well, thank you, Chair and uh, Mr. Hanson. I'm kind of wondering, like it looks like we haven't hit those projections of the targets in the last four years and the three years, but it looks like we're still trying to put it. What, what, why would we hit the targets now? I don't not quite see what kind of actions we're doing that suddenly we're gonna hit those targets. Um, so to some extent, there's a lag between our actions and performance against the targets. Um, one of the biggest ways that the council has influence over roadway safety is in the projects that we're funding and that enter into our long range planning processes. And so the immediacy of the impact isn't, isn't necessarily related. However, um, one value in setting the targets um, in the method that, uh, that, that has been developed over the past few years is that it, it sets an, an aspirational benchmark where if we're speaking with our values that our ultimate goal is to end uh, fatal and serious injury crashes, um, that somehow we have to be tracking our progress towards that. And these targets sort of illustrate where um, maybe we're not getting there yet. Okay. Just a follow-up. Follow and could you maybe like point where some of our uh, more critical areas of fatalities have been occurring and maybe what we've done you know, since that time or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to mitigate those uh, fatalities? Unfortunately, that's not my area of expertise, okay. um, but I, I will say that uh, to some, uh, there's some element of, of um, I'm forgetting the technical term for it, but uh, corridor analysis in the Regional Safety Action Plan. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, so, Madam Chair, if I may, Council Members, one of the, the challenge with this, and I think certainly that we, we heard at TAB as TAB, uh, heard this item, um, you know, it's never, it, it never feels appropriate or good to say 600 is, is the target and, of, for serious injuries. And that's, you know, as, as Jed said, it's, it's toward the aspiration of eliminating these altogether. Um, but under this methodology that uses a, uh, you know, basically a straight line projection toward that, toward that goal in the, in the state plan. So, uh, the, you know, there's certainly a, a feeling of dissonance as you're setting this target, but it is rooted in uh, the, the numbers and then something that we're very seriously addressing through our work plan, as, as uh, Mr. Hansen also noted, around uh, the TPP as well as the safety action plan for the region. These numbers are challenging. These numbers are unacceptable, and we have a lot of work underway, both to understand it, but then ultimately to act and uh, work toward eliminating uh, these kinds of tragedies on our roads. Okay, thank you. There's no questions or comments. Um, I'll just make a quick comment. This is always a big topic at TAB in general, um, even when we're looking at the regional solicitation. We want to look for examples of projects um, point you to the spot mobility um, uh, projects that we've funded over the last few years, because safety is a big piece of that discussion. And in general, when we're looking at um, any of the roadway projects, and even some of the bike trail, safe routes to school, it's it's really something that TAB is intentionally woven in everywhere. Um, but again, we build something, it, it takes, those are projects that are a few years out, so they may not be reflected in the numbers that we're actually seeing. So. Um, if there's no other questions, then um, the proposed action tonight is that the Metropolitan Council adopt the 2023 annual targets for the roadway safety performance measures as detailed in Table 1. And I would entertain a motion to approve business item 2023-51. Motion to approve. Moved by Councilmember Chambliss. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Fredson. Is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Aye.
Um, now we're on to our next business item, which is business item 2023-35, a joint item. It's the 2023 budget amendment. And we have Ed Petrie and Nick Hendrickson. Good afternoon, Chair Committee members. Ed Petrie, Director of Finance, Metro Transit. Nick Hendrickson, Finance Manager for Metropolitan Transportation Services. Uh, we are here this evening to present business item 2023-35JT. It's our carry forward budget amendment. Well, you'll notice this amendment is a little larger this evening than what our normal amendments are. We're actually combining our carry forward with our first quarter amendment together. So that is why you're seeing a rather large amendment this evening. It includes both changes to our council adopted to CIP moving projects forward as we have funding available. But we also have a couple changes to our operating budget that we'll talk about this evening. Uh, one comment I do want to make is, you know, as Ms. Kanderson mentioned earlier, is about the full funding grant agreement for the gold line. If the full funding grant agreement is approved by the FTA, it's under uh, final federal review at this time. If it does happen to get approved before the February 27th meeting of the Transportation Committee, I would hope and plan then to then amend, bring an amended bu budget amendment back, bring this one back, bring in the gold line FFGA, and then take it forward. If it doesn't come uh, through before that period of time, we will then do a separate budget amendment, just a standalone for the gold line. So it'll be one or two different Ys in the, if you have the, uh, the two different cross Ys in the Y here that we'll bring forward. Uh, I will go through the adjustments here for Metro Transit, uh, answer any questions on both the operating and the capital side, and then turn it over to Nick for MTS. The items for uh, the Metro Transit, the largest portion of it is, is uh, changes to authorized new projects where we are actually bringing uh, funding forward as they're moving forward. Uh, some of the major projects are we have the Blue Line extension. We're actually doing a net adjustment of about $957,000. We had a couple items that we were working with MnDOT on. They were potentially going to be doing some adjustments or doing some work for us on the Blue Line. They're not going to do that work now, so we're going to be returning those funds back to MnDOT. Uh, we are adjusting the gold line to the, the final Joint Powers Board committed levels. So we're making a $1.9 million to adjust to their, the Joint Powers Board levels. On the B line, uh, we're, setting, or we're setting up uh, $21.8 million of federal and RTC funds uh, to purchase 60-foot uh, BRT low floor biodiesel buses for the B line for delivery sometime in 2024 so we can move into revenue service in late 24. Um, the, uh, we also have a number of items that are that just that I'll go through. We have some non-revenue vehicles, training vehicles, service trucks that were in the CIP, some track work, track work replacements and bridge maintenance, support facilities and facility improvements. Uh, we have various uh, IS capital projects, some transit capital upgrades, and some ca uh, video camera trailers. Uh, we have the Transit Master, the IL, IVLU replacement on our buses. Uh, we have some modifications to the Ruder Garage. As you're aware, with the, op the new opening of the new Minneapolis Bus Garage, North Loop Bus Garage, we'll be moving the service from the Ruder Garage down to the North Loop Bus. So we're going to be starting to be begin some work on the Ruder Garage, make some modifications, for, for example, like to move the non-revenue shop and some of those areas in, into that garage and to utilize that garage. Uh, so with that, uh, Madam Chair, committee members, those, that's the, the majority of the items that are on the Metro Transit capital portion of the budget amendment. And before I go into operating, I would stand for any questions on capital. Yeah, uh, thank you. Any questions, comments from council members? Okay, right, you can go ahead. Okay, great. The item for the Metro Transit on the operating side is we're transferring $10 million of motor vehicle sales tax down to our capital program, bringing $10 million of federal funds into our operating program. Uh, our last amendment that we did last year, we did the same thing. This is, this is an item that we do where we, where we will move between federal and invest funds between the two programs. It does not have any impact on operating, does not have any impact on the capital, but it actually allows us to leverage the funds that we have and basically allocate it to the various projects, whether they're going to be federalized or operating using operating funds like motor vehicle sales tax. So it's allowing us to basically leverage our funds between the two programs, have no impact on either one. So that is the, the, the adjustment for Metro Transit. Now would stand for any questions on that. All right. Any questions, comments? All right, we'll turn it over to Nick. All right, thank you. Uh, for the MTS portion of the amendment, uh, first I'll start with the operating budget. This amendment takes uh, two actions in the MTS operating budget. In Metro Mobility, we are requesting to increase the salary and benefits expense budget by 167,000 to include two customer service representatives 
that are being added in response to higher call volumes. And MTS is also requesting um, just over 1.2 million in MBES revenues to be transferred from the contracted services operating budget to the capital program and an equal amount in federal funds to be transferred from the capital program to contracted uh, services operating budgets. Um, those are our two um, operating amendments. Uh, just, I can stop, pause for any questions. Okay. Questions or comments? Okay. All right, as we transition into the capital side of the amendment, there are a couple things that are taking place. <coughs> First, in the administrative uh, section, I would like to mention what an amazing job the finance team has done in identifying projects that are in our authorized capital program that can be closed and repurpose any existing RTC that can be made available to complete existing and future projects. So as a quick reminder, uh, there is no formal action to take tonight on these administrative adjustments, uh, but we've included them in this uh, amendment for transparency and uh, accounting purposes. So as a result of this reconciliation, uh, in the closing project section, we are removing over um, 8.6 million of completed projects from the MTS ACP that are fully expensed. And in the authorized new funding section, as I mentioned earlier, staff has identified existing RTC authority that is in our ACP. Uh, we are requesting to repurpose some of the unused RTC that is currently in our two technology categories and reprogramming those funds into the small bus and big bus categories to complete bus purchases um, and future projects. So essentially what we're requesting to do is reprogramming about 3.8 million of unused project balances to help fund needed bus purchases. Uh, also in the authorized funding section, MTS is requesting to bring into the authorized capital program just over 12.2 million in RTC to complete current bus purchases, uh, small bus and big bus purchases. So these bus purchases are already in process and already authorized in the ACP and includes bus purchases for Metro Mobility, contract, contracted services, and suburban transit providers. Uh, the additional RTC is needed to complete these purchases as a result of significant price increases to the existing contracts. And tonight our MTS fleet manager will be providing background on the bus replacement challenges in an information item presentation. So this amendment demonstrates commitment toward asset preservation and supports the thrive outcome of stewardship by assessing future needs, responsible planning and management of financial resources for Metro Transit and Metropolitan Transportation Services. Our requested action is that the Metropolitan Council authorizes the 2023 unified budget as indicated and in accordance with the attached tables. Thank you and happy to answer any questions. Thank you both. Any questions or comments from council members? All right, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2023-35JT. So moved. Second. Moved by council member Zarin and seconded by council member Sterner. Oh, coming. I couldn't hear. Sorry, Cummings. thank you. Cummings. I wasn't quite sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, is there any other discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're on to our third business item for the evening, business item 2023-14, Master Contracts for Arterial BRT, Section 106 Consultation Services. We have Adam Smith. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Barber and committee members. My name is Adam Smith. I'm Environmental Compliance Lead within the Arterial BRT Department at Metro Transit. And I'm here this afternoon to present business item 2023-14, which requests that the council authorize the regional administrator to negotiate and execute contract 22P322A with 106 Group Limited and contract 22P322B with Mead and Hunt Incorporated for section 106 consultation services in the amount of $550,000 each for a total not to exceed value of $1,100,000. Um, over the next five years, Metro Transit anticipates planning efforts to begin on multiple projects that will use or seek federal funding, including upcoming arterial BRT projects such as the Metro G and H lines. Uh, consulting services are needed on these projects to complete the federally required Section 106 Historic Resources Evaluation Process in coordination with the Federal Transit Administration and the Minnesota State Historic Preservation Office. To date, Section 106 consultation services have been procured on a project-by-project -project basis 
for arterial BRT projects. So now by seeking to award two master contracts for Section 106 services, staff aims to minimize administrative effort for future Section 106 procurements, allowing greater flexibility and improved schedule efficiency as emergent needs for consultation support are identified. Today's action, I'll note, does not authorize any expenditures. That will occur through future council capital budget actions. Um, I'll also note that OEO set a DBE goal of 8% for this contract and has determined that the firms being recommended for award have met the DBE requirements for this contract. In closing, business item 2023-14 requests that the council authorize the regional administrator to negotiate and execute contract 22P322A with 106 Group Limited and contract 22P322B with Mead and Hunt Incorporated for section 106 consultation services in the amount of $550,000 each for a total not to exceed value of $1,100,000. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, any questions or comments from council members? All right. Um, seeing and hearing none, I entertain a motion to approve business item 2023-14. So moved. Moved by council member Fredson. Is there a second? Second. Second by council member Chambliss. Is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those nay, motion carries. Thank you, Adam. Uh, now we are on to our fourth business item, which is business item 2023-33, which is the Metro Gold Line Bus Rapid Transit Full Funding Grant Agreements, if awarded. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so uh, council members, thank you. Uh, my name is Alicia Vapp. I'm the project director for the Gold Line BRT project, and I'm here today to... Um, ask you for authority to execute the exciting FFGA that we're anticipating from the Federal Transit Administration. So I have a presentation that I'll be going through. Um, so the Golden Line Project is um, an important project within our metro system. So it not only connects to local bus service in downtown St. Paul, but it also connects to our arterial bus rapid transit network and to our light rail, uh, the Green Line in downtown, downtown St. Paul. So this is all day service um, along the corridor from downtown St. Paul all the way out to Woodbury. Um, it is, uh, has a budget of 505.3 million with 10 miles, um, 16 new stations, some of them in downtown St. Paul and several along the corridor through the many cities. Um, we are purchasing several vehicles, 17 vehicles with this project, so 12 of them are diesel, five electric, and uh, we will be adding charging stations in the East Metro garage. Uh, we'll be doing some modifications to that garage as part of the project as well. Um, we're adding um, additional surface park and ride projects and then uh, one uh, structured parking ramp that is located in Woodbury um, and several uh, grade separated crossings of the project. So we do have several um, funding sources that are part of this project. Uh, all the local funding sources that are identified in this um, chart <clears throat> have been committed by all the, the stakeholders. Uh, we've also been, the project has been really fortunate and has um, received over $13 million in regional solicitation funding, um, which is great. Um, also, uh, the two counties are the kind of the larger um, contributors for the local match, so they're both putting in about $120 million, so both Washington and Ramsey County. Um, and then, of course, today we're here to um, talk about the FTA funding, which is the $239 million. So where we are in the uh, current overall project schedule and, and where, have, where have we been? So in um, 2019, the council did amend this project into the TPP. Um, environmental work has been completed. So an environmental assessment was completed in 2019, um, followed by the finding of no significant impact in 2020. Um, and then after a, a lot more design work and engineering and um, different work, um, we did award um, a contract for civil construction to Ames Construction. That was last July. 
Um, construction began last summer under a letter of no prejudice or an LONP, uh, really which allows the project to use local funds for construction um, in advance of federal funds being anticipated. So um, if we're being able to be reimbursed for those funds. Um, that, that contract had a 17% DBE goal. Um, and then where we are today, we did learn on February 1st that FT transmitted the FFGA to, to Congress for the required 15-day congressional review period. So that's where we are right now. Uh, one thing that I d didn't include in these slides, we also are doing a series of open houses for the project starting um, late February to early March, and that's really for, to talk about construction for the up upcoming construction season. In, uh, and those are located in St. Paul and Oakdale. And could, I'd be happy to provide you with additional information if you need. And so today, here to ask you for um, authority to execute um, the FFGA. So the proposed action is that the Met Council authorize the chair and regional administrator to execute the full, fund full funding grant agreement for the Metro Gold Line Bus Rapid Transit a project with the Federal Transit Administration in an amount of $239,345,549 if awarded by the FTA. Stand for any questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments from council members? All right, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2023-33. I'd like to move the item. Moved by council member Sterner. Is there a second? Second. second. Seconded by Councilmember Cummings. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, now we've got one more for the gold line, um, and it's business item number 2023-36. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Uh, so this business item is uh, to use an option on existing contract for station pylons. So um, the station pylons for the ABRT projects are um, a really um, signature kind of station feature for the project. Um, the council purchases these pylon and provides them to our contractor for them to install. Um, and so there is an existing council awarded contract um, that's the Albrecht Sign Company that was awarded in 2021. The contract included options for future projects, including the Gold Line project. Um, there was no DBE set for the pylons, but our civil contractor does, as I mentioned previously, have a, have a DBE goal of 17%. Um, there was a cost escalation built into the pylon contract, um, and so it's similar to how bus contracts works. Um, and this is a good business decision for the council to, to do business in this way. Um, a new pylon contract will be procured in about four years, and OEO will again uh, complete a thorough review for DBE assignments at that time. Albrecht Sign Company is um, a local business, um, has, is a local business that's uh, located in the Twin Cities as well. So the proposed, proposed action today is that the council authorize the regional administrator to exercise an option on existing contract 19P385A with Albrecht Sign Company for the fabrication and delivery of 31 pylon signs for installation on the Metro Gold Line Bus Rapid Transit Project in an amount not to exceed $734,529.52 contingent on the receipt of the full funding grant agreement from the Federal Transit Administration. With that, I'll stand for questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments from council members? All right, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2023-36. Zirin moves. Moved by council member Zirin, is there a second? Second. Second by council member Fredson. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we are on to business item 2023-49. It's the Metro Green Line Extension Reciprocal Easement Operating Agreement uh, with Belt Lake, Beltline Mixed Use LLC. And we have uh, Jim Alexander here to present. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Jim Alexander, Project Director for the Green Line Extension. So uh, tonight I have a item for uh, consideration. It's a reciprocal easement and operating agreement, uh, and we're looking to modify a transit easement that we have at the Beltline Station. So I have a couple of slides to go through and give you some background. 
So to start, we're looking to uh, um, uh, have 268 stalls at this uh, station. This has uh, been in our program from the start. And uh, we originally had intended to have this as a surface, uh, surface lot. The city uh, of St. Louis Park uh, desired to put this into some type of ramp structure. And so we uh, worked with the city to, uh, to, to, uh, to try to make that happen. And this is part of it, uh, essentially take those 268 stalls where surface uh, stalls into a structure. Um, part of this, there was a CMAC grant uh, awarded to the city uh, the amount of a little over $6 million there. And uh, we have uh, 2.5 million in, in the project, which was originally uh, allocated for that parking lot uh, to, to uh, contribute to the cost. So this requires that we enter into a reciprocal easement operating uh, agreement with the developer that the city of St. Louis Park has hired as well as the city and modify a transit easement uh, uh, limits. Uh, the, REOA is it's, uh, it's, it's deemed, uh, it really defines the ownership and maintenance responsibilities um, of the, of the tra transit parking stalls, which the uh, council will own. And there are shared spaces, elevator stairs, there's landscaping uh, pieces that also need to be addressed in terms of who maintains and, uh, and, uh, and uh, contribution of that, uh, the cost of those items. And as, as I indicated, the parties would include the Met Council, the city, uh, the EDA, the Economic Development Authority, and uh, the Beltline Mixed Use, who's the developer. And also the transit easement needs to be transformed from that uh, lot configuration to the uh, structure configuration. So this is what the original uh, intent was to uh, have the uh, 268 stalls in a lot just north of the uh, station. <coughs> um, in the green there, that's the alignment for the, uh, for the uh, Green Line extension. You see the station there in yellow is the uh, is a, is a bicycle ped uh, uh, bridge that goes over the tracks and over Beltline itself, and then the, uh, the park, parking ride lamp uh, or uh, lot on, onto the north there. You kind of see in yellow there, that's where the transit easement is currently located. The, uh, the property uh, to the north of that is owned by, by other government entities. So this is what the uh, city has been working on with, the, uh, with their developer, uh, where the parking would go for uh, our, our use would be in that uh, lower left uh, building there, uh, all told 570 stalls at this uh, structure, and we'd have 268 stalls. They're located in the basement, uh, the first, second, and third levels. And we also have uh, provisions for an operator uh, uh, restroom uh, accompanied with this. Other, other pieces of development, uh, mainly housing. There's low income as well as market rate, as you can see there. and. Uh, the, uh, the building uh, just north of where the parking ramp is is tended to have some commercial space as well. So Madam Chair, uh, the uh, proposed action of the Met Council authorized the regional administrator to negotiate and execute a reciprocal easement and operating agreement with Beltline Mixed Use LLC, their successors and assigns and the St. Louis Park Economic Development Authority and modify the associated transit easement for the Beltline Boulevard station park and ride. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Um, uh, Council Member Zarin. Yes, Chair. Uh, my question is, um, it's unclear to me, if we, do we own the land or do we own part of the land? H how does that ownership, um, how, how does that pair out? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Council Member, we actually have a transit easement we purchased from the uh, original property owner. So we have that, uh, I think what's key here is we have continuing control of the parking spaces as well as that uh, operator restroom. So we, we own that, and that's, that's been purchased by the project. Okay. okay. Additional questions? Councilmember Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for this. Um, this is very similar on the surface to a development that was going to happen in Hopkins with another uh, private developer that, that uh, didn't come to fruition. Um, although on the surface it looks very similar. Can you talk a little bit for my edification and for anybody who's listening, what are the differences? I realize it's a different developer and I know there were lots of issues as that project went along, but can you talk a little bit about what the differences are between this and the one that was going to have happened at the Moline and Hopkins? Sure, uh, Madam Chair, Council Member, I think I, maybe to talk, uh, maybe I'll, everyone's not aware of the Moline that's being referred to in downtown Hopkins Station just north of Excelsior. Uh, that uh, was programmed to have 189 stalls, and it was going to be part of a 
kind of a similar situation where there were apartments uh, above and uh, additional parking for those apartment users as well as transit parking. Uh, I think the, the key difference here is that uh, the developer in the Hopkins situation versus St. Louis Park was unwilling to abide by the federal regulations that we need to abide by given this is a federally funded project. There were, uh, there were clauses that need to be, be, need to be adhered to. Uh, it got to be at one point where the developer was looking to uh, take those 189 uh, stalls and, and essentially split those in half in terms of what we would be able to control, and that just uh, was not uh, within our program. We could not support that with the FTA money. And so I think that was the, that was the key thing here. Uh, although it has been a, a long, hard discussion, the city of St. Louis Park and the developer in particular has understood the need to follow FTA clauses, otherwise we can't make this work. And uh, it has been a struggle. It's been, we've been, you know, we've been at this, uh, so I think uh, the first, I think the developer came aboard around 2017, so it's been quite some time to uh, work this out. And I think folks uh, outside of the FTA don't quite understand uh, all the clauses that need to be adhered to, but we have strings that we need to, uh, we need to follow. Councilmember Cummings. Thank you. How will you control the uh, parking in the building that is for transit? Uh, there's a separate, Madam Chair, Council Member, there is a separate uh, entrance and exit for this, uh, for this particular parking that we have. Uh, the, the, the full design hasn't been uh, laid out yet, but that'll be something that we have, uh, we have uh, full access to it and we can comment and they will have to pay attention to our, uh, our comments. And so we'll ensure that uh, we can get our, uh, what we need for this project uh, instilled into that project. Councilmember Cummings. I'm, I'm just, I'm a little bit confused as to, so someone pulls into the public transit parking who has, is living in one of these buildings or they're having a big party or whatever. How do you, how do you control that this is in fact transit parking that someone doesn't just come and leave their car and use it for overnight parking or that it's a t additional parking for the private development? How do we, know that that is in fact transit parking that is being enforced. Uh, Madam Chair or Council Member, I think we'll have to work that out with the design. I don't have that in hand right now, but that's something we'll have to uh, adhere to when we, uh, when we get to that point. Councilmember, My final comment. I understand that there are differences and I know that, that it was a challenging project. I just, I, I would ask and I'm sure you're you of all people are very aware that you know this. This is um, it's challenging. Um, the the other one that didn't happen wound up in the city being sued and losing, and it was very costly to uh, the city. Certainly, um, I hope that this works out the way that it is going to. I think that these private. Uh, Partnerships can be great, but they're also very challenging because there are so many requirements the FTA has, we have, developer has. They, we have different agendas in bringing them together and something that can be successful can be extremely challenging. So um, on the other hand, this development is terrific. And there's no question that this is just a wonderful development to come up around the Beltline Station. So it is my hope that this proceeds um, in a, a way that is satisfactory and meets the needs of all of the parties. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments? All right. Um, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2023-49. So moved. Moved by Green Council seconds. Member Brad Siddons, uh, seconded by Council Member Zarin. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. And the motion carries. Thank you. Um, so just before we move on to our information items, um, I would recommend that item one, three, five, go consent to the full council, two and four go non-consent, and uh, council member Cummings, would you have a preference to move um, the last business item, non-consent or consent? Non-consent. Thank you. Okay. Everyone agrees? All right. Very good, we're on to information items. So um, our information items this evening, uh, the first one is a small bus update. And we have Paul Colton here. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Council Members. And uh, um, 
here to go through kind of the history and story of our small bus uh, purchases, where we were, where we are, and where we think we will be. So uh, this supports the capital amendment that you approved earlier, uh, but it's kind of the details behind what has happened. So I'm excited to share that with you. All right. So in any good story, we have to set the foundation. What, you know, what did things uh, used to look like? Uh, what are the challenges financially? How is it impacting us? Um, what are we doing for other mitigation uh, strategies in the world of fleet? And then finally, your questions. Um, normally, I would love to do this as a uh, answer questions as we go right along, but I think the presentation builds itself to answer some of those questions as we move along in it. So um, if we can hold questions to the end, that would be, that'd be great. All right, so currently the Metro Mobility Fleet uh, has 629 vehicles. The vast majority of those are the small cutaway style vehicles you see in the photo um, on that screen. And the uh, minimum useful life of vehicles as defined by the Federal Transit Administration is five years or 150,000 miles. We have in our own local policy that they are five years and 175,000 miles. And uh, to be uh, completely honest with you, we put way more miles on those over the five-year period. So we're, by the time we retire them in a normal cycle, we're at 250,000 to 325,000 miles on a vehicle. So we get, we get good life out of them. And what we find is five years is about the right amount of time to replace them. At that point, they're starting to face some you know, more significant maintenance issues. So here's where we're currently at with our fleet. And this is our current, this is what's currently out in service today. Um, um, everything from a, a, a few 2014 vehicles all the way up to our fleet of 2019 vehicles. And you can see the average uh, mileage by year um, on the right there. And it's significant. It is really significant. Um, one uh, little anomaly I would like to point out is that in the 2018, we've got a lower mileage than our 2019. We have a lot of our Metro Mobility Agency fleet in that year. Um, our agency fleet runs five days a week. It's primarily peak service for uh, developmental uh, uh, disability agencies. And we think of those as kind of like long school bus routes that, that run to those agencies, picking up our customers and then taking them home at the end of the day. So they have less miles on them, which does bring down that average. Um, and we have gotten creative and incorporated some of those into our demand fleet, our you know, um, our door to door fleet, our door to door service. So what are the what are the challenges we're facing? So in 2019, that was the last time we received a brand new bus for Metro Mobility or any of our suburban transit authorities or Transit Link. Um, in 2020, uh, we were ready to move forward with a purchase, and the state did not have a state contract. It's, uh, they were revamping the state contract. There were some things they wanted to fix, they wanted to correct. Thought we would have it by July of um, um, go out that year. It did not. It did not get out until the until the late late fall of that year for the 2021 uh, purchases. So we have a new contract in 2021. Of course, we jump all over that. We're going to replace our 2015 buses. We're going to replace our 2016 buses, and maybe even start to look at some of our 2017 because we have an inkling that this is going to take a long time to build out. Um, unfortunately. Um, the Ford, uh, Ford had a, a huge chassis shortage, and that's really what's driving the majority of this issue and this challenge. Um, they scaled back by about 75% of their chassis manufacturing in 2021 and into 2022, and are now ramping back up to a larger production in, in 2023. Um, compounding this are uh, uh, component shortages, so you may have your chassis at the bus plant, um, and they're ready to go online, except we don't have a windshield washer motor, or we don't have 
uh, all of your seats in yet, or we don't have all of your windows in yet. So, so then the manufacturer has to reshuffle what they're gonna produce, and it becomes very challenging for them and obviously frustrating for us. Um, in 2022, um, we got, it, it became really clear we we're gonna have price increases because of increases in the price of steel, increases in the parts, um, Ford increasing their chassis, pricing, no uh, government discounts, all of those things compounding to higher prices. So we're looking at a magnitude of 35% increase on our current 2021 contracts that are already signed and in production. Another 35%, uh, uh, 32% increase looking uh, at 2022, the items you approved back in October, and for 2023, um, uh, a little bit higher than a little bit higher than that. So um, all of this is kind of pivoting off of the original 2021 pricing on the state contract that was submitted. So our production timeline, um, again, haven't had a bus since uh, 2019. We got our first bus um, with much fanfare on January 31st, and I'm happy to report we've received our second bus today uh, has arrived, and we will start seeing um, more trickling in. Um, uh, most, of, most of our order of 39 will come in March, and then the remaining 10 from the first bill should come in about May. Um, the good news is on this is that uh, uh, through numerous discussions with the president of Forest River, who's the manufacturer of our different brands of buses, and they work with our vendors, um, they are committed to working with the Met Council. We are very fortunate. They haven't canceled our contracts. Um, they view us as an important partner. Um, and they're saying all the right things. So in July, we are scheduled to go online with um, um, through March of next year with the remainder of our 2021 orders. And again, that's 308 buses. They've also stated that we will start on your 2022 order right after that. So we're just gonna be a continuous build of about uh, uh, 40 to 60 buses a month starting in um, July, August. And then in September, it'll ramp up even more because we have two contractors. And um, again, in March, we'll, um, they'll be finishing up that first production. So uh, bus pricing increasing, this is, uh, this is the part that's extremely painful. Um, in 2019, we paid $71,000 for a bus, and that was an increase on 68,000. My goodness. Um, so the 21 pricing came out at 85,000 uh, per unit. Um, and amended, when we amend this, um, it's gonna be about in that $115,000 range with our vendors. Um, and we are expecting that the 2022 pricing is gonna increase upwards of 150,000. And part of what's happening here is, I think the manufacturers are trying to get ahead of the game a little bit because they keep, they keep raising prices multiple times during the year because of the volatility in the market. And so I think they've jumped a little bit ahead to try to hedge that. Um, we're obviously, with MnDOT, gonna do some negotiating with our vendors to get the very best price that we possibly can but also understand that they need to make sure that they survive because we need them to continue to be our vendors for the purchase of this equipment. Um, so the, um, tonight was the first action, uh, the carry forward budget that um, would bring in $15.7 million uh, to help offset the 2021 and 2022 orders uh, in that price increase. Um, we estimate that we're going to need about $5 million to cover the cost increase on the 2023 um, and about $8 million on the 2024 uh, prices. Uh, and that's just anticipating what I'm hearing from the leadership at Forest River and our vendors on where pricing is going. So the belief is it is going to stabilize because Ford is producing more chassis. 
and the and the and the markets are doing better as far as uh, uh, pr production of all of those bus items. <clears throat> pardon me, that we need. So, um, I think we'll learn a lot this year. If if we see those production numbers hit the way that they think they will, I think we'll be in good shape moving forward. We're going to know, and we'll know a lot more on the 2023 pricing in the next month. Vendors have submitted their information to the state, and the state will be making that public very, should be making that very shortly uh, to us. So what else have we been trying to do? Because obviously our vehicles are, have high mileage, um, they're, they're old, and um, they, they need more maintenance. Um, and I don't know that I need to remind anybody, but... Our ADA service is, you know, a federal right. It's a civil right, and we want to make sure that we honor our commitment um, every day. So one of the things um, that David had mentioned in his TAC update was the minivans, and we are uh, examining the state of Oklahoma's contract where we might be able to purchase some of these accessible minivans. We think there's a market niche that we can serve well in the Metro Mobility Demand Service. Um, I'll be coming to TAC in April because on uh, March 1st, I will be in Indiana uh, overseeing the start of our 10 bus production and making sure we get that exactly right uh, for us. Um, the other thing that we've done is we're working with our contractors to use some of our operating funds to help offset some of the unusual expenses that we're seeing as a result of the buses being over their five-year life, six-year life, seven-year life. Um, things that wouldn't show up in the five-year period as normal maintenance. And so we're working with them to uh, reimburse them for some of those costs. Um, we're also holding back retired fleet um, as, as we start to retire out some of our buses uh, for parts and body panels because one of the things that they cannot get easily are various parts and, and um, those, body, those body panels when we have accidents. So this hopefully will speed up their ability to repair our fleet and keep it on the, keep it on the road. I want to go back to that slide just briefly. Other things that we have looked at too, we have looked at all arrays of accessible vehicles. And what we're finding is the story is the same everywhere. Prices have skyrocketed. Availability is really limited by chassis production. Um, and they're a compromise. Everything that we're looking at is a compromise to the way that we deliver the service in the most flexible and efficient way possible for Metro Mobility. So um, we have done the research, um, but are not encouraged by what we, are, what we are finding. So again, feeling grateful that we're gonna have buses coming here in the coming, coming year. So these are kind of the actions that will be coming up for um, approval, um, the budget uh, amendment for um, today. The, I'll be coming forward to you for the minivan purchase uh, probably later next month. Um, and then we'll start in the con uh, small bus contract amendments um, um, over the course of the next couple quarters. And uh, um, again, working to get the best price that we can before we come to you with that. Um, and then pending available funding authorization of the 2024 small bus purchases next fall and beginning of next year, depending on how the funding lines up on that, uh, both in terms of RTC local funding and our federal NTD dollars that we use to purchase buses. Now, with that, I would be glad to entertain any and all questions that you have on the small bus uh, fleet. Thank you, Paul. Um, Councilmember Zarin? Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you for this. I, I think I must have missed this. So when we enter into a contract to purchase these buses, uh, there is no guarantee that the price will hold or there is no cap for uh, as to an increase in the cost? Chair Barber, council member, um, normally up until 2019, it was locked in stone. There was no change. It was easy peasy. My life was simple. With the price increases 
that are going on, there is nothing locked in right now. And so we've looked at different avenues. What can we do? What are our options? Well, we could cancel the contract. That'll put us in reorder. That would put us at the back of the, back of the line for ordering. Um, we could take legal action, and that might take years um, because it's complicated. We have a contract with our local vendors who are the dealer representatives for the manufacturer in Indiana. The manufacturer in Indiana relies on Ford to receive the chassis. And so there's, it, it, um, the layers start to get deep as you work through everybody who is involved on, on all of this. Um, so the, the pricing, again, we are going to negotiate everything we can to get the most advantageous in the current marketplace that we can for the Metropolitan Council in the state of Minnesota. I hope that's at least a little bit helpful in laying that out. Councilmember Cummings. Oh, thank you. Um, and I think I've asked this before, but is there a secondary market for the vehicles as we retire them? Uh, council member, chair. Um, there is. And so the plan is that um, some of our fleet that is um, in really um, the worst shape um, those are the ones that we will probably hold back for some of the, some of the parts and so forth that are, are good, the body panels that are good for our contractors. We also may hold back a couple vehicles until we get more of the new fleet in just to give them a bigger spare ratio. But yes, eventually, um, we've just signed a contract with a new um, um, auction house and um, they um, are excited to work with us to help us sell um, all of these buses when they start coming up for resale this, this summer and fall. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Zarin. My question was around retail or resale of these uh, vehicles and, and that, that question was answered. Thank you. All right, additional questions or comments? Council Member Sterner. And just uh, thank you, Chair. I'm wondering how many of these buses are electric buses or in if they're not, when are we looking at the electric buses and that then? Chair Barber, council member, um, we will be coming back to you in March with the um, zero emission bus plan for MTS, which begins to start to lay out um, a, uh, a logical plan for moving forward with the uh, electrical fleet. Um, I will just say right now in the small bus world, the range is so limited um, for us that within the study itself, our consultant said, to, to meet the, the, the toughest day, you would need 1,700 Metro Mobility buses to make service right now with the where technology is at. And our fleet is about 600 today, so it would be a big jump. But with technology improvements and so forth, we will certainly get there. And Charles, you may have a... Uh, yes, Madam time. Chair, uh, yeah, just to add to that, it's something we're excited to continue to watch. There's not a mass-produced commercial product in the small bus market yet, but it also seems like it, if, if Ford or another manufacturer that can meet by America requirements jumps into that space, uh, like they are with light duty vehicles, it, things could change very quickly at that time. Until then, they're really each produced as a, as a highly customized one-off unit that uh, costs well over double uh, the, the price of a regular bus and could do a quarter of the work of one bus. So the, the technical proposition just is not materializing yet, but it's something that we think could pivot very quickly coming into the future. We're very excited to bring you the results of our evaluation and some of the nearer term steps that we can do with the MTS fleet very soon. So besides Ford, who else makes chassis as General Motors or, or Chrysler or Dodge, anybody like that uh, make them besides them? Or? Chair Barber, Council Member. Um, to meet by America uh, in this platform on the medium duty chassis, which the Ford E Series is, um, uh, it is the only one that meets by America. Uh, Chevy has moved all of their production to Mexico, and so it does not qualify for by America. And therefore, an awful lot of content would have to go into that vehicle when they bring it over for the, to the upfitter. And so it's very difficult to meet by America with the Chevy chassis. Um, Chrysler has a lighter duty chassis that we have looked into and are looking into. Um, it's really more of a four year, a four year vehicle um, and a much more expensive vehicle than what we're dealing with today on the E-Series chassis. So financially, 
uh, we're financially a little bit challenged in looking at that vehicle, but there may be a, a spot for, um, you know, for us to purchase some of those to, in order to um, help mitigate some of the delays in the current uh, build. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Chambliss. Uh, thank you, Chair. So for the, um, for the production of our um, vehicles, are they set to kind of be, do you think we're gonna be ramped up by 2025? 20, uh, um, and would, would that reduce our expenses? Yeah, Chair Barber, council member, um, I believe that by 2025, the majority of our fleet will uh, be built and um, in service by 2025. Partly because of the size of this first order, you know, 350 buses essentially that will be produced or should be produced by the end of Q1 in 2024. Um, Council member. Yeah, uh, to clarify, I yeah. meant our supplier. Um, I think you mentioned that they are getting, starting to get ramped up to prior uh, service levels. Ah, cor uh, correct, I understand now, yes. so. So I believe Ford by 2025 will be back um, to 100% chassis production that they were in 2020. And the rest of the vendors who you know, provide content to those vehicles, um, from what I'm understanding is um, this year and into next year, um, <coughs> their ability to produce their, their products is improving or will improve. So yes, by 2025, um, things should uh, look much more normal from a production standpoint. Councilmember Chambliss. Yeah, I, I'm not that familiar, but I'm just starting to hear more about, you know, the Buy America push. Um, is that going to make um, resources more scarce if, if there's a big push for that? And, and maybe, maybe, I'm, you, maybe I'm targeting the question to the wrong, <laughs> you know. Source, but uh, Madam Chair, if I, if I could, this has certainly been a, a big topic of discussion around the industry. In fact, in Seattle at the APTA uh, Transform Annual Conference, uh, it was a significant discussion topic in the in the bus and paratransit CEOs seminar that that I was part of. That that was prior to the beginning of the conference, and uh, this what, this topic was discussed, you know, very extensively. Um, the Buy America restriction is, is a significant challenge. The Community Transportation Association of America sought, uh, they sent a letter to the Secretary of Transportation uh, seeking that the, that the administration provide waivers for other, uh, other manufacturers to, to address this issue, it's saying there's a 20,000 bus backlog and it's growing. The amount of chassis every year is, is 5,000 and shrinking. Uh, you have to do something. We we will be out of business if if something is not done. Uh, the administration was in attendance at the conference. They actually joined that session, and they were pretty unequivocal that what the president supports is man manufacturing in the United States and uh, expanding manufacturing in the United States is the is the remedy for this, not uh, by providing additional waivers. So, uh, no uh, short term fix, uh, as you know, from the FTA administrator herself, in terms of the supply side of this. But um, you know, something that we're continuing to look at. The experience of other providers, you know, shared in that same meeting, is that when they've pushed on price, uh, they've found that their orders have been canceled and. And what, what they had been hoping for a replacement this year will actually be in three years and probably will cost more. Uh, so that's, that's been the experience of others. Um, in our case, you know, it really is this, this perfect wave of not having replacement available in 2020 and then deferring additional years of all that replacement on a five-year replacement cycle to where, as, as, the, as the slide said, you know, by the end of this year, under the FTA rules, and ours are a little bit longer, uh, our entire fleet is eligible for replacement. So, so getting that replacement in is really the essential ingredient to delivering the Metro Mobility Service, but also uh, th these buses are going to suburban providers. These buses are used for transit link. They're, they're used around the region. And uh, the unfortunate reality we face is that if we want to, 
if we want to take advantage of the production we have locked in, which is great and enviable by many, including ambulance uh, firms, delivery, uh, recreational vehicles, they would love those chassis for their project and not ours. We have them lined up. The challenge is that they'll cost more than anyone in this room believes they should. Um, but that has, unfortunately, as a result of the pandemic and the supply chain shortages, become the price of doing our business. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments? Councilman Bazaar. Could I make a comment, please? Oh, please. Um, uh, it, it just seems to me that uh, the way things are going here, um, it would be a really good idea if we would hold on to our fleet as long as we can, uh, especially if it means uh, our costs continue to rise like this. Um, a, if we if we find some of these older uh, units that are uh, still in good shape uh, that can be retrofitted to electric, I think we can roll these things even longer. Uh, if that technology happens, I think uh, the council would be in a really good position to be able to uh, contract uh, with uh, a provider that would be able to electrify our existing fleet. Um, I don't know what that's gonna cost, but it, it looks like the costs are going up no matter what. So if we can find a technology for retrofitting, uh, putting uh, uh, electric underneath these, and uh, then, then maybe we can have an extra 100 if we, if we retrofit them. So let's think about that. That's my thought. And thank you for your comments. I think that this is such a challenging problem. The more creative we are, the better. Like there's, it's obviously something that we have to deal with because we do need to do some fleet replacement, but can we be somewhat dynamic throughout the process to make sure we're doing the right thing? One of the things I think that I appreciate the most is, is the, the uh, minivan pilot. And I'm really, really happy to hear that TAC um, is gonna get a chance to preview um, that um, and, and have some input on what things look like. I think that's a great idea. But you know, if there's other thoughts or ideas, you know, I'm sure people would welcome any feedback you all have. So, Council Member Fredson. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, obviously some big challenge is the eye-popping increase from $71,000 to $165,000 in four years. And, um, you know, I support Buy American. I believe we should be building stuff in America with American workers and we should get and pay good, good wages and, and earn good benefits. Um, I guess one question is, like, how confident are we that this is, like, did the cost of building that bus actually go up by that much money over time? Or is anyone digging in to see, you know, where the, where the profit margins are? So I guess that's just, it's eye-popping challenge for something that we support. And then um, on the flip side, like the transportation funding is not doubling. You know, in fact, our primary funding sources are losing value. So um, it's just, uh, which hopefully can be addressed, but I think that, uh, or at least part of the challenge that we're facing can be addressed this, this year up at the Capitol, but we've has to keep on telling the story of all, to all of our um, elected representatives up at the Capitol, because I don't think the, the vast majority of them understand that transportation funding sources are losing value, and I, I had no idea that the cost of a bus could increase from 71,000 to 165,000 in four years. <laughs> There's a reason we wanted to make sure it came to the committee because you see the numbers, it is really, really jaw dropping. Yeah. All right, any other questions, comments? Well, you, you just, were, oh, go ahead. Just a quick comment, if I could, Chair Barber. Um, on that, too, right? We, yeah, sticker shock is. Is, is absolutely amazing um, in all of this. Um, one of the things though that because we're using federal funds, when they submit their uh, amendment to the state of Minnesota, they have to demonstrate where those price increases are, how much they are, um, and obviously where they're coming from. So, and that's where MnDOT then does some negotiating as well on the, on the pricing, um, both with the vendor and then back to the manufacturer. So. 
um, that's kind of our avenue for our in our ability to try to drive down the price at least a little bit. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? All right. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. It. Um, and we'll love to hear some updates, especially on the minivan pilot and other options. Absolutely. Um, now we're on to our next information item, which is the 2022 year end ridership report. We have John Harper and Eric Lind. Good evening, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm John Harper, manager of contract transit service in MTS. And with me as usual here is Eric Lind, manager of analytics and research at Metro Transit. And um, I, before we get into our presentation, I do just want to uh, make a real quick comment to bolster uh, Paul Colton, uh, fleet manager's comment about uh, our use of the fleet. And we absolutely use the fleet until the, nearly the wheels come off the buses. And um, was demonstrated by the, the mileage that Paul showed in that slide. And so I just want to um, bolster his comments about, about use of the fleet and the, um, the expertise of our contractors to maintain the buses uh, well beyond what many agencies expect to get out of fleet. And so um, we do what we can. But uh, he had some bad news about where we sit with fleet. We have some good news about where we sit with ridership. Uh, I think every number in our presentation here is a positive number, is an increase in ridership. Uh, I'm going to go through the numbers, and then, as usual, Eric uh, will go through, uh, drill down a, a level or two and talk about a few specific things. As we know, uh, the pandemic has been tough. Uh, we've, you know, it, it took quite a hit on all of ridership uh, across the region, all modes, all types of service. Express service, in particular, was very hard hit. Uh, when we go through this presentation, you'll see that we are rebounding now. Uh, before I get into the numbers itself, I want to just share a comment that Acting General Manager Kenderis made in the Insights uh, article that uh, just came out this week, I believe, and that is uh, she said that uh, a vision, uh, we need to have a vision that is broader than simply returning to pre-pandemic. And so this, this is really about recovering from where we where we have been in the pandemic, not trying to get back to where we were, but how do we move forward and how do we do some innovative things? And so I'll go through the numbers and hand the presentation over to uh, Eric to drill down uh, into a, a little bit more specific. So this first slide here is, uh, shows year over year, and the 2022 ridership is up over 2021, uh, all, all months of the year. And so we are increasing uh, year over year. And when you look at the different services that we provide, uh, as is usual, the workhorse is the local service. You can see the local service is expanding. That's the big blue bar on the bottom. The uh, large red bar is the light rail service that also uh, is increasing. Um, some of those other bars are increasing as well. They're just a much smaller percentage of the overall service, but each bar is getting bigger. The, the bar overall is much taller than it was a year ago. And so we are uh, moving up the hill. To drill down into the modes of service, uh, want to share that as we go through the next slides here, some of the biggest percentage increases are from our smaller programs. The, maybe the smaller percentage increases are the largest nominal changes. Uh, start from a much larger number, it takes a much larger increase to move that, move that needle. And so you'll see Vanpool, for example, is up 50%. Our Vanpool program is a relatively small program, but we have made some strides. Uh, to uh, enroll some new businesses that have not been in the program before. And uh, current businesses have been returning workers to work. And so a few of van pools have been coming back where they have not been uh, in during the COVID times. 
And you can see also North Star is a big mover, but once again, that's a, a small number relative to the overall. But every number here is positive overall. It's a 17% increase in 2022 compared to 2021. If you drill down into the bus mode, into the types of service, uh, you can once again see the express is the largest percent change. The local service is up nearly 3 million in 2022 over the previous year. And so overall, that's an 18% increase. Uh, so good news on all fronts there. Because it's the end of the year, we uh, bring in a snapshot of the regional providers 2022. Uh, as we go through each quarter, we talk just about the Council of Metro Transit and MTS, but now because we're at the end of the year, we're, we're talking here also about the other regional providers. And uh, these providers took a very large hit. Uh, most of them are very express-based. And that express ridership took a, you know, as I talked about earlier, took a significant hit with the pandemic. Express went way down. And so you're seeing these numbers rebound uh, in the 60, 70, 80% range from a, a much lower base. But uh, that does show that people are returning to work. Uh, we are seeing differences between days of week uh, as opposed to uh, just all weekdays being a good commute patterns but uh, so this is across the board this is all modes and types of service for us this is all providers in the region seeing increases uh, and so really it is a good news story across the board so that is the those are the numbers and i'll turn the presentation over to eric to drill down and uh, talk about a few specifics thanks thanks john um yeah so typically highlight a few things that we're seeing uh, in the trends that go a little bit deeper. But I do think it's worth echoing. Uh, transit ridership is up 17, 18% year over year. That's really good news. Uh, we're, we're seeing the rebound um, across the board in all different modes and all different types of routes. And that's great. Uh, I'm gonna highlight for you two kind of uh, angles of looking at that. One is where the ridership is happening, and the other one is when the ridership is happening. And then I'll give uh, a particular bit of good news on our newest metro line that opened last December. But just to remind you, when we're looking at these ridership numbers, they're, they're a confluence of two different dynamics. One is demand. People need to travel, want to travel. They have uh, an appointment they need to get to, or a job they need to get to, or they just want to go to the mall. If it's going to be a ride, we have to meet it with an opportunity where they can travel when and how they want. So when those things come together, we get a ride, we get a trip. Uh, and the more that happens, the more ridership we see. The reason it's worth breaking this apart is, uh, as I've talked to you about before, um, we have some, some different directions in some of these trends. So the past few years, we've had this reduction in demand, you know, especially since COVID, but as that comes back, we're, we're seeing shifts in the demand and desires to travel different times of day, different places. The opportunities we've been providing have also been cut back. And largely that's because of the workforce shortage that we've talked about and are obviously working very hard to address. But right now the situation is, as John was documenting, the ridership is up. We think the demand is up. And our opportunities to provide those rides are not as um, robust as we want them to be because of this workforce situation. So in a way it's good because we're saying, okay, the, the demand is returning, we wanna meet it with those opportunities to keep building on that ridership situation. Uh, but but uh, uh, remember that it's kind of these two pieces that have to come together. Okay, so where, where the ridership is coming from, um, this map is a bit abstract, but that's it, on purpose to kind of get you to focus on uh, a couple of those shades of blue and green. So we have transit market areas, which are essentially you know, the policy that the council has adopted to tell us how to deploy our service in different ways in different parts of the region. And transit market area one, which is that darker blue section of the core cities, really represents where we put our 
high frequency service, the bulk of our all day, uh, all directional, you know, the, the, the core of the service. Um, and that's in fact where two thirds of our rides are coming from. Uh, in this example, September 2022, but really this pattern holds as you look at uh, ridership across the year. And if you step out one level from that, you get to transit market areas one and two, that becomes 94% of our boarding. So really what you're seeing the story is that the ridership is in these highest uh, transit market areas, which represent where we put our kind of, again, core service, our high frequency service. And uh, as you think about the community express market and the outlying suburban uh, local market, um, it's not to say that those rides are not important, but when we're talking about the annual uh, totals, they're representing a smaller share. The other really strong pattern that's been consistent throughout, and, and it continues to be there as we see this you know, significant growth year over year, is this distribution by time of day. And what we uh, have observed is that the morning and afternoon uh, peak times, as much as they're still there, are no longer sort of equal. They're, no, they're not symmetrical the way they used to be, where you have this flow in and flow back out, right, of, uh, of a commute. Instead, we see a really strong PM peak that's much higher than the AM peak, okay? And this just emphasizes the types of trips that people are making on board transit right now, uh, which is to say all different types. So they're, they're not making predictable you know, in and out return trips that we can serve with, uh, you know, a, a dedicated um, commuter express market, for instance. Rather, it's moving in all directions, all times of day. And you do see some signs of other types of trips that we know are happening, uh, specifically student trips. So that 3 p.m. hour, which used to be on the way to, but not quite the peak of our, of our service ridership, is now the busiest time of day for 3 to 4 p.m. hour. And that really emphasizes the high school service that we're providing to Minneapolis and St. Paul high school students, but also that's the time of day when a lot of other students of all kinds in colleges and universities are traveling as well. Um, the other thing to note is that later on in the day, if you kind of look at this dashed line, which represents the pre-COVID you know, typical boarding pattern, our late evening ridership right now is really not very different from what it was in uh, pre-COVID times. And uh, again, what we see when we're looking at why people are traveling, uh, those, those might be those kind of return trips on a, a service job. Maybe someone's working in a retail establishment or a restaurant taking their ride home at that time uh, versus a, a ride home that we might have thought of as the work trip at 5 p.m. in the pre-COVID times. So all this accords with, with the idea of changing travel behavior patterns and changing demand, uh, not just the type of service, but where and when uh, in our system. And we're, we're continuing to try to meet that. And of course, as we talked um, at our last meeting when I was introducing the Network Now uh, project that Metro Transit is embarking upon, that's gonna be a big part of this. How do we uh, conform our service to what we know the demand is right now so that we can be really effective in, in rebuilding, as John was saying. Okay, the last thing I wanted to highlight was the D-Line. So Metro D-Line opened in December of 2022. Uh, this is sort of complicated, but I think the message will emerge. So bear with me if you will. So we have three different types of service uh, listed in this graph. In the top row is the weekday service, the Saturday service is in the middle row, and Sunday service is in the bottom row. And then we're gonna have three months. So starting with November, and then three years. So uh, the 2019 period, 2021 period, and the 2022 period. So looking at November, this would, this would have been Route 5. Uh, in the black is sort of your pre-COVID typical ridership by uh, each of those service days. In gray is uh, the 2021, so like a year ago um, ridership. And then in red is the ridership uh, just in last November, so a couple months ago. So if you think about what we've just been presenting, the overall ridership report is kind of moving from that gray to the red. We see pretty significant, but not you know, remarkable increases. It's kind of steady growth. So that's what was happening with Route 5. So in December, we came along and introduced the D-Line, uh, which, uh, as you all know, upgrades the experience, it upgrades the vehicles, it upgrades the speed, 
We hope it upgrades the reliability. Uh, and one thing it also does is upgrade the weekend service. And what you see is the results of those upgrades. So the first two months of operation in December and January, this is the D-line uh, plus the small amount of rides that we're still seeing on the Route 5 as an underlie service. Um, what you see is across all of those types, you see increases, but the biggest increases are in that second and third row as you go from the gray to the red or from the black to the red, in fact, on Sundays. You see increases in 2023 over not just 2022, but actually pre-COVID. And so uh, this is, in one sense, not surprising because every time we've opened an Archeo BRT line, this is what's happened. We've seen immediate, regular growth, and we've seen it mostly on the weekends, and it's where the change in the service is strongest. So we've seen a response to this, really lowering the barrier for using transit for all types of trips, and people are bringing their trips to our service. And this is what we wanna see. So a few key takeaways, um, you know, Again, the growth is happening across all modes. Uh, it can't be said enough, I don't think, because there are so many messages about transit right now, and very few of them have been that transit is uh, being used by more people than it has been. Uh, so let's keep emphasizing that, I would suggest. Um, the BRT overall is nearing, and I, I would suggest by the end of this year, we'll certainly be 10% of the regional ride. So we're, we're building this metro system, this BRT system that really serves all day, all purpose travel, and we see it immediately with the D-line. Uh, and, and again, with the sort of map, we saw there is this core of ridership that's happening uh, in, our, in our strongest transit market areas. So for 2023, uh, obviously, we want <coughs> to meet the demand with supply, and that's gonna require success on the operator hiring front and operator retention front. Uh, and that's going to dictate how we can, and, and we hope we will be able to increase that service provision. Uh, there still is a lingering question of, of how solid these telework patterns are. Um, they've been in place for a couple of years now for most businesses. Uh, there, there may be changing work practices around those, but for the most part, um, we still see, as John was mentioning, this, this kind of um, peaks across the weekdays, so you see strong Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday travel, but certainly not Monday and definitely not Friday. Um, you know, if that, if that holds, you know, we still have sort of a cap on this commuter express demand, which is more like a, you know, 60% uh, demand of maybe what it would have been pre-COVID. So how do we meet that? And then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Network Now project essentially is tackling all these questions. How do we optimize our service, given the conditions that exist now, given the resources that we have now, uh, so that we can have uh, continued growth and ridership thanks to this uh, resilient service we want to provide. So I will stand for questions. Thank you. Questions, guys? Council Member Chambliss. Um, thank you. This is really interesting um, information that we've been waiting for. So. Um, Glad, glad to see kind of where we're at right now. I'm, I'm really interested in um, the decision to travel with us uh, and the, the opportunity. In terms of the decision to travel with us, I'm very curious about the, the individuals that have access to travel with us and those that desire to have travel with us, but they don't have access because we don't have service due to um, our scoring for travel demand. Now with Network Now, we're assessing, you know, potentially what to do um, where there might be more opportunity to provide service. Uh, do, are we getting closer to being able to service uh, beyond the core cities that now have, you know, our regular metro transit buses, uh, they've got the micro transit, they've got the um, the light rail and the um, ABRTs. So they're going to be pretty much fully serviced very quickly once um, all of the the ABRT lines are are built. So. To me, the obvious thing would be to looking at where else there is demand that we um, 
for, uh, we, we have not set up a foundation or framework to create the demand. Um, if you're living in uh, the suburbs, you don't plan to take a bus if there's no bus service. You plan to get a car <laughs> or, um, or you plan to ride a bike or a carpool or something like that. Um, so how do we um, have, I guess what we're terming more geographic equity for the suburbs um, with this new um, Network Now plans? And just where we are with people traveling differently for different reasons at different times. Um, I think this is a perfect time for us to look at some of those areas that do not have sufficient uh, transportation options. Uh, Chair and Councilmember Council Member Chambliss, that's a great question. I think it is pretty much the core question of Network Now when it comes to the engagement and discussion around values that we have to do. Uh, because it is asking the question, uh, should transit be concentrated where it's used and you know, uh, where it's very efficient in gaining rides? And how much of the transit service that we provide should be provided in a way that is more of a lifeline service or more of a, um, a covered service? Or in some, some way you can describe um, service that's there for a purpose other than to just be the most efficient ride generator you can get. And um, that, that is a question for all of you and for people in the region to decide. What is the emphasis and how is our service distributed across the spectrum? Um, but, but definitely the question of how, you know, what are the expectations for every community in the MPO to be able to get transit service. I mean, that's part of what we need to decide as, you know, as part of this Network Now project for sure. Um, and I think the key thing is that if we, you know, um, that supplying transit uh, in order to meet people's desire to travel comes with this caveat that we can't do it everywhere, at least efficiently. So we have to decide how much um, we are going to forego those, the, you know, the trips that people may want to make uh, simply because we can't really sur you know, survive providing those trips to people. So it, it's, a, it's a really fundamental question, this, this allocation question, basically. And again, because we have limited resources in terms of operators, we have to make trade-offs and allocations across this where you know, we can't provide everything to everybody. So again, that's the core of the network now engagement that we're going to be doing is how do we answer that question? Thank you. Additional questions, comments? Councilmember Sterner? Thank you. I'm kind of looking at like your, the D line, you know, that just went through. And if you look at the green line and the blue light rail, it goes by pretty well every major sporting venue. And with the D line, the music venues are lined up too. So I'm kind of wondering if there's any kind of marketing where people would just take this for their evening transportation. We get them there back and forth safely, but I, I think it gives the people who you know, take part in alcoholic beverages and efficiency getting out of parking and lower costs, if that is something we could look at marketing that or if you see that as being a possibility. Uh, Chair and Council Member, I think that's a great idea. Our, our, um we really thrive in places where people are trying to go to a certain place all at the same time and where parking is hard. I mean, that's where transit shines. Uh, we've served all those football games at the Viking Stadium. We, we serve all kinds of events like that. Um, the D-Line, you know, again, drops people off right at the door of the Mall of America is another place that a lot of people want to go at the same time and may not wish to park at. So um, I think our marketing department is developing some lists of events that they're going to partner, you know, partner with this, uh, this summer and fall. So I'm sure that they'll be trying to figure out where they can work on the D-line. Okay. Then one other question is, I, when I talk to people out in the, my district and people I know, one of their big barriers to taking transit is safety and security. You know, sometimes it's elements we get later on the light rail where maybe they're, you know, smoking know, some chemicals or actively, you know, even could be tobacco. And then, you know, they feel like they're their family members out. It's just they don't feel like 
they feel that's safe and they don't want to see the elements. I'm wondering if you if you felt that that safety and security was there for our operators and our clients, would that help us quite a bit more in our ridership or do you think it's negligible and something like that? Uh, Chair, council members, that's obviously a very important question. Um, I'd say we, we know for a fact there are people who say they're not riding because they don't feel safe. But uh, I would just point out the main driver that should be motivating all of us to fix these issues are the people who are riding. And again, there's more and more people on board than ever before. Uh, we are serving thousands of high school kids a day. So people say that they don't want to see their kids on the system. I think, well, you know, there are a lot of kids on the system and shouldn't we be fixing this so that they can have a safe experience? Uh, and certainly for our operators, you know, we know that's a concern as well. So I think there's a lot of reasons to um, change the trajectory of safety on board. Uh, and I think, you know, we, we don't lack for reasons to try to, try to make it happen. Um, the interaction with ridership is very hard to measure. You know, so people are saying, I don't ride because I feel unsafe. It's hard for us to measure like, oh, if we changed everything, how many more rides would we get? So don't really want to go down that road, but know that, of course, it's, it's going to impact people's decisions to travel and how they decide to travel, for sure. All right. Thank you. All right. Any additional? All right. But before you go, um, I believe this is Eric's last transportation committee meeting. He's moving on to the Center for Transportation Studies at the University of Minnesota. So we're going to miss right. you. We appreciated your insight. So thank you so much, but congratulations. Oh, thanks, Chair. Thanks very Absolutely. much. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Perfect. On to our final um, uh, our information item is the 2023 Transportation Committee Work Plan. Who's kicking it off? Uh, Madam Chair, I can kick things off. Council members, this, this item is the start of a conversation about uh, work plan items. Um, posted with the agenda was version one, and actually we have a version two that we'll distribute as well that in includes some additional MTS planning items that um, we weren't able to incorporate before posting time. Uh, the plan is not to go through the item tonight. The plan is to share it with you and then to seek your input and review of those items as well as ideas you have uh, for items that the council should consider in the year ahead. Uh, we would then bring it back as an information item next time. Perhaps discuss it in a bit more detail, but um, in discussion with the chair, our, I think we'd, we'd recommend not actually bringing it for the committee to adopt until March uh, when the committee may have a new composition and uh, want, may want to reflect new perspectives, but also want to first capture this council's perspectives uh, in the draft document before we prepare it for approval. Uh, Wesley, anything you want? No, I'll just echo that it's the start of a conversation. We're really interested in what you want to prioritize for your time in this committee and, and certainly as new members potentially join this committee as well. Um, when you look at the um, first draft, you'll see some items that are really familiar, things we bring to you on a regular basis already. For example, for Metro Transit, you'll see the quarterly service and workforce items. Um, you'll see our quarterly strategic plan updates, um, but you'll also see some uh, new items that are specific to this year as well. So it's meant to be a start of a conversation and just really interested in, in your feedback in the coming weeks. And I just add, um, take something like the transit wave advancement policy. That's something that we added on to the work plan last year. And that, so that's something, it helps staff figure out where to guide things as well. Um, that can reflect kind of things we want to work on. So. Uh, don't hesitate to put out something that might be outside of the box. It doesn't hurt. Um, helps us as we go through. All right. Any questions, comments from? All right. We'll look for feedback probably at our next meeting. With that, then I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Councilmember Sterner. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Chavez. All in favor, say aye. 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 And we are adjourned. Aye.